Hello, good afternoon. So I'm here to talk about with IPv6. Um, I work at Covalent IO. We are developing a, a software called Cilium. It's open source that allows you to have security at layer seven. And let's see if this works better. And um, it also provides IPv6 uh, connectivity in your uh, infrastructure as well. So what should you expect from this talk? Um, I'm going to give a really quick history just uh, about IPv6, uh, and then I'll uh, talk about IPv6 in Kubernetes itself, uh, if it, can, it can, run it, can run it or not. And uh, while I'm doing that, I'll also do a step-by-step -step tutorial uh, to talk about each component in Kubernetes and what you need to change or not in uh, each options. So let's see about uh, IPv6 is true. So everything started in uh, around 91 when ITF might wondering if we had enough IPv4 addresses available for in the future. So and as they realized that we might not have a problem in the future, they created a, um, a group called Road and in 95, they developed the first version of, uh, let's call it IP next generation, which was the draft for IPv6. And after a couple of years, like three years uh, later, uh, it came up the RFC 2460, which was the IPv6 uh, draft for RFC. And in 2005, there was a stable version of IPv6 in Linux. And in 2008, we start seeing some news regarding the IPv4 exhaustion and we should uh, do something about it. Some ISPs start looking around and they thought the best way to, to prevent IPv4 exhaustion was to do NAT over NAT over NAT and instead of upgrading directly to IPv6. And in around 2012, 2014, containers starting to pop up, which were, they were designed to have IPv4 connectivity and not uh, going directly to IPv6. And, uh, uh, July this year, IPv6 was considered the uh, internet standard, uh, number 86, and hopefully, let's see if next year, in 2018, will be uh, the year of IPv6. So, uh, what about Kubernetes uh, running uh, with IPv6? Uh, the first question that I come up with was, is it really worth it to make this talk? Uh, and what about the infrastructure? If, I have enough, I have the infrastructure to run Kubernetes with IPv6. And what about the Kubernetes itself? Does it run? Does the, the pods and the services and the ingress uh, Kubernetes concepts, uh, do I need to make any changes at all? And after that, if I have a, a Kubernetes infrastructure, what about my apps? Will they run it or not? So let's find out. So when I start Googling, the first result that I got was if there is any benefit of using IPv6 in my home. And the, I'm not sure if you can see it, the first answer here uh, was, a funny answer was, but with IPv4 you cannot have billions of IP addresses for your home appliances. And with that, Jing uh, Yang will not be able to have his uh, smart fridge in, the, in this uh, home. So, but the, the answer that was chosen was this one, uh, no, there is not any benefit of using IPv6 at home, which I don't completely agree with. I agree more with the, the next answer available, which was, yes, there is a benefit if you are using for uh, education. If you want to try it out, IPv6, I think the safest place to use it is in your home, where you can break things and at least to find out if things work or not. Um, and later on, you can at least uh, deploy it in your uh, infrastructure, in your company infrastructure. Of course, uh, your house is not the data center. So, unless it's a startup, of course. But if it is a startup, you start to plug things up and things might burn down in the end. <laughs> so, this concept, pets versus cattle, is not new. It's something that uh, it has shown, uh, popping up around the containers uh, world. And in your house, you usually have pets. So what does this mean? Does this, this means you have an IP out of slash 24, for example, for each type of pet. And you know which pet has which IP address. But in your data center, you have more pets. So you have cattle. And you, you start 
uh, doing slash sec slash eight for that each type of, of animal. So you have cows and you have sheep and you start splitting that by colors. For example, you have black cows on slash 16 and so on. So, but hopefully your data center doesn't have actual cattle. It has containers. So you, you start doing that, this approach with containers. Start um, splitting them up by color types, for example. And as your containers start to growing up, as the number of developers start growing up, the number of containers start to grow up as well, and your users as well. So you end up with millions of containers, and the rest to manage that will be impossible to, to control that. So what is the best solution for this? Will be IPv6 or, no, let's do NET, for example. Let's do SNET. That, that always solves the problem with this. So we have a multi-level NET, and you start having containers uh, on top of PMs, and then you have your cloud provider or your ISP. They will also use NET, so you have you are wasting resources and your users will be happy about it because they have a slow connection. That, that's also always a good idea. No, but seriously, let's go to, to assemble a, an IPv6 cluster. So you usually end up with two options in the beginning. You either uh, deploy it on-premises or you deploy it on, on, the, on the cloud. And the first question that you might wondering is that, is my operating system uh, supports IPv6 or not? Uh, well, as I've shown in the first slide, uh, at least Linux has a stable version of IPv6 uh, since 2005. And if you are not upgrading your Linux since 2005, I think you have uh, worse problems than to worry about IPv6. And the next one will be, uh, does my server support IPv6 or does uh, the cloud provider support IPv6? So you, for example, here I have uh, look at AWS and GCE. Uh, AWS can at least provide you a public IPv6 to the VM itself. GCE can provide you at least, as far as I know, can provide at least um, until the load balancer. So inside your, uh, your own uh, cluster, you have IPv4. Until the load balancer, you can have IPv6. And what about your users? Will they use IPv6? Well, I took this screenshot uh, at the end of August, this one here, and we can find out that one in five users are using IPv6 worldwide. So I think it's, it's a good idea to start looking at IPv6. And this is, well, this is worldwide, and this is from Akamai, uh, the top countries that are using IPv6. So we can see in Belgium, uh, at least half of, the, uh, half of the users are using already IPv6. And the United States alone, it's two out of five. So at least for the, for the Belgium side, if you have Belgium customers, you should be starting to get worried about this. So let's go to the purpose of this talk. Let's go a little bit deep dive. So um, this is a Kubernetes uh, a normal cluster. Like you have master and you, you can have multiple masters and you usually have multiple workers. On the master side, you have controller manager, the API server, and the scheduler, and you also have the etcd, which stores all the data. And on the worker side, you usually have a container runtime, and you have kubelet, kubeproxy, and a CNI plugin to manage all the network uh, in the containers running in the worker. So let's start with the etcd in the master side. So etcd has 53 CLI options, and I'm talking about etcd, not etcd cuttle, which is the client to connect to etcd, and out of which only five of them are relevant for IPv6. And we can see that this is mostly like uh, addressing, it's just an address, and we can simply replace the address with the, with the local host of IPv6. Is this simple? Yes. If it works, it will work. If it's not working, you'll eventually find out, and you can report it on a GitHub issue since this is all open source. And if you're asking me, what about HTTPS? Well, HTTPS should not matter if it's running on IPv4 or IPv6. But if you're talking about certificates, then yes, the configurations are aware of IPv6, so you can have a configuration for IPv6 in the certificate itself. I will use HTTPS in 8CD, so I'll have certificates with, uh, with IPv6 on it. So I'll start by deploying HTTPS on the, on the master node, and I will have only one instance of HTTPS running. Uh, can you guys see the, the fonts on the back? Okay. So, 
So this will be my service of uh, service file for etcd. I, you can see that I have lots of options here, um, but the important ones are the ones that have IPv6 on it. And I also have the certificates. They have, uh, they are aware of the IPv6 address in there, and this is basically it so, uh, on the etcd side. So let's start. Let's start etcd. I always messed up the operation. And we can see they are up and it's up and running uh, since 40 seconds ago. So at least it's working so far. So let's move on for the next component, which is uh, Kubernetes. Now we are going to kubescheduler. Kubescheduler is a simple component. It only has around 30 options and only Kind of three of them are relevant for IPv6 uh, in our cluster. Um, this will, uh, we can also apply the same solution I have applied in each CD, and we can see if it works or not, like the same way we have implemented with each CD. This is a simple component uh, regarding the, the IPv6 uh, side of, the, of the, our cluster, because it only manages which node will receive which pod. Um, so I will not start Kube Scheduler now because it will need Kube API server to run first and uh, later on I'll run both at the same time. So Kube API server is a really uh, important piece of the, of the puzzle in Kubernetes. So it has 120 CLI options and all, only five of them are relevant for IPv6. So we have a new option which is also important for the Kubernetes cluster which is uh, the service cluster IP range, and I've selected FD03 column column 112. So I'll, what does this mean? This means I can have uh, 65, around 65,000 different services running on Kubernetes. And a service allows you to have uh, multiple pods serving the same service, but the service will be an abstraction for those pods running on backend. So uh, Q, uh, controller manager will assign uh, uh, automatically an IP out of those range 112 and it will automatically assign for the service and this way uh, all the other pods will be able to communicate with the service without knowing the destination IP because pods come and go and you cannot make, make sure which pod has which IP at, at, this, at a certain point in time. Uh, a warning here, please do not try this at home with Kubernetes uh, less than 1.8 because this was a pull request um, recently merged and it will be available on 1.8 that will be released the, the late, uh, later this month. This option service cluster IP is available for IPv4 but the pull request was designed for the, the IPv6 cluster, uh, so to have the IPv6 option enabled. So let's start uh, Kube API server first, and then let's start um, Kube scheduler. So this is the service file. We can see here I have the advertise address, which is the node IP. Um, the etcd servers, which is the etcd server that I've started up um, three minutes ago and also the, the certificates to, to connect to etcd, and also the service cluster IP range that I've talked about previously. So let's start Kube API server, and let's check, let's check the status. Okay, it's up and running. So, so far we have two running, etcd and kube API server. Um, now I have to start the um, kube scheduler. So in, in the last service file, uh, the line address was a v4000. Uh, mm -hmm. um, and so it still binds to v6 as well? Yeah, yeah, it still binds to v6 as well. 
so on this uh, this uh, uh, cube scheduler only has uh, 30 options i will use uh, cube config to have the everything to connect to the master inside so cube config is a configuration file that you can create each couplet and it allows you to create a configuration file to have a, a client to know how to connect to the API server. So the screen is too small to see all the file, but it has the, um, the certificate embedded, and it also has the, the server address here, as you can see. And the user will be the cube scheduler that I've set up. So let's start the cube scheduler. and check the status. Okay, it's up and running. So far, things are uh, going well. So the next one will be an important component, also an important component of Kubernetes, which is the kube controller. So kube controller manages the whole cluster. It's the brain of the, of the whole cluster. And it has five relevant options, similar uh, with Kube API Server. But uh, we are having um, three important ones, because they have specifically the IP addresses on it. So let's take a look at them. So we have the service cluster cider, that we, uh, service cluster IP range. It, it's the exact same one that we have specified in Kube API Server previously. And the services will be across clusters. So it will be the abstraction for the pods running. And now we have the cluster cider. Uh, so the cluster cider will be the cider for your pods running in Kubernetes. Do not confuse them. Uh, don't, do not confuse the cluster cider with the with the physical cluster addressing that you will set up for your VMs. So all the pods running in my cluster will have fd zero true column column slash eighty. And now we have the node cider mask size, which will be uh, ninety six. What does this mean? So we have the cluster cider, which will be that one. I'm not sure if you can see the bold, uh, which are the, the, the mask for the, for the IP. And now we have the node cider of 96. This means the first node that will register itself to the, uh, to the cube controller will have a cider of a subnet of slash 96 out of the slash 80. The second one will have, sorry, the second one will have FT0200001, uh, so which will be subnet out of the slash IT. This is the net, how the Kubernetes deals with the networking. So it adds a subnet for each node out of the, the whole uh, network that will be assigned for the pods containers. And the last node will have uh, FFF column column zero, uh, column zero, column zero, uh, slash 96 as well. So we can have 65,000 nodes. And on each node, we can have 4.3 billion containers, if you want to run it, 4.3 billion containers. So this is lots of IP addresses. But you, don't, you should not care about IP addresses at this point, because you have a controller manager that deals with that. And you should forget about IP addresses. So you should really only to know uh, where the pods will be, how the pods will be deployed. You, you should not care if pod A is running on worker one, if uh, pod B is running on worker two. You should have other options. If you want security, you should look at different levels than L3, L2 and L3 at this point. So let's go, oh, uh, let's start kube controller. This one. Okay. Cube controller manager. So I have the cluster cider here, which is FT02, and the node cider mask. Uh, oh, I also have the allocate node cider. So this is what a uh, cube controller will. Uh, know that it should assign to each node uh, a particular cider out of the slash 80. And I also have the service cluster IP range here. So let's start a uh, cube controller. Uh, 
And let's check the status. Okay, up and running. So so far we are good in the worker side, in the master side. Let's move on to the worker. And in the worker side, you, you have a container runtime. On my case, I choose Docker. And so the Docker, the network plumbing will be made by, in Kubernetes will be made by CNI. And you can find the reasons in the link uh, that is in, on the slide, or if you Google why Kubernetes doesn't use uh, libnetwork. So what is libnetwork? libnetwork? Libnetwork is the plugin for Docker only. If you start a container with Docker run um, dash dash net and you choose a plugin, it will be the, a, a libnetwork plugin that will run in Docker, in, in Docker itself. And Kubernetes allows you to have a CNI plugin, which, a diff which is a different type of plugin. Uh, it, it, doesn't, it's, it does not belong to Docker itself. And it, it's a different choice that they have made uh, for, their, for, their, for Kubernetes. So the CNI plugin that I will choose uh, will be Cilium. Uh, so, as I told in the beginning, Cilium provides the, the L7 security as well IPv6 as a first class citizen. When we were creating Cilium in the beginning, we thought, okay, so we need to have something for containers. The first thing we thought about it was uh, we need high scalability. So, and we were not going to choose IPv4. We later on find out, like, um, we have to have IPv4, but for um, other environments that don't use IPv6 yet. Uh, so Cilium will use the, will be aware of the options that I've chosen in Control and Manager, which is the allocate node siders, the cluster cider, and the node cider, and it will know which cider it, it should be running on each node. And it will route all the traffic across nodes. And so that's why I told before that you should not care about IPs because the CNI plugin will be take care of that. So you should not really uh, uh, be aware of that this anymore. And you also have the service routing. So the services that I've explained uh, before as well, will be, the routing of those services will be made by the CNI plugin. In this case, it will be made by Cilium. If you are using a different CNI plugin, um, it might not be the CNI plugin itself that will deal with this. It will be Kube proxy. So, I will not run kube proxy because CNI, uh, Cilium does already the service routing, but some plugins will use it. So as far as I know, there are not um, an option that you need to change in kube proxy to run with IPv6 if you are using a different, a different plugin than Cilium. And we have kubelet, which has the 160 CLI options, but <laughs> fortunately, we only need three, and so uh, we need the cluster DNS, which is um, a, the DNS that will run on the on the Kubernetes cluster, and this IP needs to to be written beforehand. That's why I had the kube DNS running with this IP. It's just an IP out of the range of the service cluster IP range, and I also specified the node IP of the node itself in the on each worker. Um, the node IP is still a uh, pull request, uh, no, that number over there. Uh, it's not be, have been merged yet, but all of the, this demo that I, I'm doing right now, it has this patch uh, compiled with the version 1.8 uh, beta uh, running on. So I'll run kubelet. And I'll, I'll, so since my machine is not that powerful, I will have kubelet on the same VM that I have the worker on. So I'll have a dedicated worker, and I'll have a VM running master, and the, the kubelet, or it will be the master slash worker. Okay, so you can see the options here the node IP, the network plugin, which will be CNI, and also the cluster DNS that we, you need to specify it beforehand. Let's start kubelet. 
And let's check, let's check the status. Okay, it's running from eight seconds ago, and I'll also start Cilium as the CNI plugin. Let's make sure Cilium is also working. Okay, it is, cool. And on, so on the lower side of the screen, it's the, the work, it's the dedicated worker that I'll only start Kubelet as well and Cilium. And you mentioned uh, Ruby proxies not needed for using the Cilium plugin? Or Sorry, can you going to be starting Ruby proxy? No, yeah, I will not start in Kube proxy. I don't need it, so I will not use it. Uh, okay, so we have a Kubernetes cluster up and running with IPv6, and so far things have been working, but now we need kubeDNS. So kubeDNS will be the DNS for all the Kubernetes cluster. It serves all the DNS, DNS requests for all the pods running in the cluster, and it's a deployment Kubernetes uh, spec file that is available in Kubernetes GitHub, and I only had to make one, one small change in the, in the deployment file, which I had to change the probe from, for quad A instead of a single A. What does, what does the probe do? So the probe was uh, checking if Kubernetes was running, or if kubeDNS was up and running. And since the kube master, so it was checking for this name here, Kubernetes not default on service at cluster. So this name here will be the default one for kubemaster. Since kubemaster was running with IPv6 and not IPv4, the, the probe itself thought, okay, kubedns is not working because I'm making a query for a single line for that name and the query comes, comes up empty. So something is going on here. I had to change it to check for quad A and the reply was uh, the proper IPv6 that was serving the kube API uh, master. Kube API server, sorry. So I will start kubeDNS, which is in this directory, hopefully. <coughs> Check. No, it's not. Okay, it's here. Uh, I'll just start it and I'll explain it. So this file is available in Kubernetes uh, GitHub, and this was the change that I had to make. So I changed it um, to have the, to connect to localhost on this port, and also the to request for quad A instead of single A. I'll also deploy the application itself and ingress. I'll explain which one, what they make on the cluster. I, they just need a little bit time to set, to boot up in the cluster. So kubeDNS will run, I don't know which worker, maybe a worker two or a worker node. I don't want to care about it. And the next step will be where's ingress. So ingress allows you to expose your services, your pods that are running outside, inside the cluster, to expose them to, outside, to the outside world. So what's the point of having, of having a cluster that is not connected to internet? So Ingress allows you to have those, that kind of exposure to the outside world. So it's also a, a Kubernetes spec file, and I didn't need to change anything on the, on the available specs files on GitHub as well. So, and the Nginx controller, ingress controller, will be run on worker two or worker one, I don't care. So this will be by de my, my demo that I, I've already deployed, and I'll have, uh, I'll be the user on the left side of the screen that will connect to the Nginx controller, and how do I find out which address it will be available on? So I'll type kubectl get ingress, and I can see uh, that this was a file that I've uh, deployed previously. It will serve for the host uh, foo.bar.com. It's available 
on these two addresses here. So FD00 column column B and FD00 column column C. So in theory, if I um, go to this link, to this address here, I should see something in my browser. And let's find out. little bit, but, okay, I just type one of the addresses, and I see a 502 bad gateway. This is good news. So, so far, we are able to connect to Nginx, which is running on one of the nodes, and I'm able to ping this side here. So, why am I getting a bad gateway? So, I have this host here, so it, it will be foo.bar.com. If I change the host, um, header to foo.bar.com, I should be able, it's a little bit, but I'll change it on my side. Uh, so this is a, a Chrome plugin that allows you to modify the host header of your request, and that's why I'm changing the host header to foo.bar.com. Let's see if there's an accept button here or not. Okay, there's not. And if I refresh the page, I should be able to see my service that is running inside the cluster, inside my cluster via uh, Nginx. So what is happening here? So far, I'm hitting uh, Nginx that is running uh, on one of, the, uh, one of the workers, and the request goes to Guestbook. So Nginx knows there is a service called Guestbook, and that service the guest book service uh, is this one here. It will have this cluster IP. This IP will, was automatically assigned by the controller manager. And it also knows there are some endpoints serving this service here, the guest book, which will be this address here. So this address is actually a container, a pod running inside my cluster, and the translation between cluster IP and the pod itself will be made by Cilium. So the request goes from Nginx. If it tries to connect the guestbook service, Cilium will know the proper address to redirect the, the traffic, and it will go to, through Cilium, and it will go directly to the pod itself. So Guestbook later tries to contact KubeDNS because it needs to know the address of the Redis master. It will receive the reply, and then Guestbook will write uh, the name in the Redis master, and Redis slave will, um, will be duplicating the entries on Redis master on its own. And Redis, Guestbook will read the data from Redis slave. So the data will be written on Redis master, Redis Live will replicate all the data, and Guestbook will read all the data from Redis Live. So if I type here John, for example, and I click Submit, so the data was written on the Redis master on this side. If I type Refresh, uh, this happened really quick, sorry, but what happened was Guestbook was querying Redis Live for the data, and it was the same data that I've written on Redis Master. So, final thoughts on this. Uh, Kubernetes has lots of CLI options. I know that, but you should at least read all of them to have some knowledge in Kubernetes and to try things out. And IPv6 is coming, so you, you, you will start having users running IPv6, and you should be aware of that. You should try this, at least this tutorial, you should try it at your home, to have some IPv6 knowledge um, where, for example, I've, I've known developers that don't even know how to type an IPv6 address with the port itself, like in the browser. So this, this concept of brackets uh, with the port, if I want to type this, it's something, so, a couple of developers don't, are not aware of. And Kubernetes is getting ready. So there are a couple of to-dos. Um, 
dual stack will be nice to have, to have IPv4 and IPv6 on the same pod. Right now, I only have IPv6 running. And these two uh, pull requests were uh, integrated in my demo. So I have compiled uh, all the components with these pull requests, which is the kubelets node IP option to have IPv6 and wave IPv6 prefix size uh, limit for cluster side. And also kube admin. So for the ones that don't know what kube admin is, it's a really, really good tool that allows you to set up a cluster with a single line, basically. And I've set up all of these services and kube API server, kube scheduler, et cetera, et cetera. This was only for educational purposes. If you want to try it out, you can also try it out. But if you want to try kube admin, you should try it. Because you basically just type kube admin in it, and you start a master and kube admin join, and you start a worker. That's, that's it. And unless you try it, you'll never find out if you are ready for IPv6 or if your infrastructure is ready for IPv6. And we, have, we had a booth on Pybos 1. I think the, the booth area is already closed. Um, if you want to ask me some questions on Twitter, uh, there's my handle. And Coming next, after this talk, into 50 p.m., there will be a talk uh, about Cilium itself if you want to know more. Um, if you have some questions, I think I have three minutes left to answer you. Yeah. So you're using Cilium as the, um, the CNI plugin. Um, can you talk a little bit more about how Cilium was able to So uh, Cilium has an option. So the question was how uh, Cilium knows how to route uh, the traffic to each node, correct? From one node to each node. So Cilium has an option uh, called Auto V6 Route. I don't remember the exact name of the option, but it inserts the, not this one. It inserts the, 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 the route. Yes, yeah, six is the first. So it inserts the routes for each node. Since Cilium knows which pod slider belongs to which node, and it also knows which node IP belongs to which node, uh, Cilium automatically adds the, 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 which subnet should be go to which network or to which IP. So for example, the other node, I believe it's, it's this one, and it should go via, via FD00 column, column C, and FD0 column column C, it's on device, uh, this name here. So that's, that's the way it, it does it. Sorry? Yeah, 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 exactly. So how does it know about the, those pod sizes of the different nodes? Is it basically have like a comp file with the credentials to talk to the API server for and the API server for node information? So yeah, Cilium connects to the API server. And Kubernetes, uh, since it alloc the kube controller also locates the ciders for each node, uh, that information is available. And you can see for pods, for the node one, you'll have the pod cider that one. And Cilium also is aware of that, of that cider. So that's the way that you can check it. Check it. If I do, probably it will be a little bigger for the screen. But you Exactly. Using that information to create the appropriate um, static. Correct. Products. Yeah. All right. Thank you so much. Oh, you have one question? So when you said that NGINX should actually connect to Gaspar, it went through Cilium. It didn't really. Yeah, it did. Cilium had already set up a route in the routing table. For no, no, no. So because NGINX only is aware of the, of the service, of the kubectl get, it's only aware of this IP here. And this IP is not, it, it should not be on the wire. So Cilium does this translation to the, to the IP, to the right IP itself. Okay. Can I, yeah, I was going to ask about that. Is that um, normally, kubeproxy would be responsible. It, 
know, either IP cables or whatever to translate between the service and then the pod address. And so Cilium is now doing that. You don't necessarily you don't need Kumi proxy. Correct, exactly that. All right, I need to stop, like the lady told me to stop, so thank you very much.